Welcome to Using the Multiple to Create Wallpaper. I'm Janet Balwig and I'm here to introduce you to a project that I developed for my screen print class that uses an addition of prints to create a panel of wallpaper. My main goal for the project was initially to get students to think about how a repeatable element can create a larger work and that might lead to installation work down the road or at least thinking about how to get a print outside of a frame. My secondary goal with the project was to give students more practice printing. This is a project that we do as their second project of the semester. And typically I ask students to print an addition of eight or 10 for a regular screen print project. But in this project, they have to print about 40 in order to get enough to make a wallpaper panel. So they really have to get in there and get a sense of the rhythm of printing, which is difficult to do if you're only printing a small edition. What I didn't see coming when I designed this project was a bonus, that students really get over their fear of printing with this project. The cool thing about the wallpaper is that, unlike a regular edition where we see all the glitches from print to print, even though all those prints are hanging side by side, with the wallpaper that is, we don't see the glitches so easily because we're forced to step back to see the whole thing, so we're not looking at it so closely. Also, it's just an impact of color, bombardment of color on the wall, so we're invested in looking at the patterns and the shapes and seeing how it all comes together. So most of those printing glitches just disappear. They, they just lessen to a degree within the panel. So the, the nice thing about that is it takes the fear away from the students because they, they see when they put the work up on the wall that all their hard work came to something really cool. And even if it's got errors, we can overlook those pretty easily. The theme of the wallpaper project is if these walls could talk, wallpaper based on self, identity, or ritual. With that in mind, I encourage students to think about how a repeating pattern might function to present an idea, to evoke an emotion, or to create an optical sensation for the viewer. For example, if I wanted to make the viewer think about tension, I wouldn't illustrate what I think tension looks like. Rather, I'd try to make the viewer feel tension through my design, through my choice of imagery, format, and colors. To start this project, I always introduce students to a reading about wallpaper to expand their thinking such as The Yellow Wallpaper, which is the classic feminist short story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. The author used wallpaper as a character and a metaphor in the life of a woman who was experiencing a mental breakdown. Always a happy read. Another reading I've used is this article from The Atlantic called A History of Wallpaper's Deception. It talks about wallpaper essentially as camouflage or a method of presenting a space as something that it's not. The author, Jude Stewart, starts off by saying, The history of wallpaper is a story of mendacity, of the many forms lying can take. Wallpaper has been guilty of little white lies, like visually altering the proportions of a room or projecting your idle fantasies onto the four walls, and also of more outright deception, of social pretension, and even the erasure of history. Another reading that I find useful is this essay, Wallpaper, the Decorative, and Contemporary Installation Art by Alyssa Author, which is a chapter in the book Extraordinary, Craft and Contemporary Art. This essay talks about how queer artists Andy Warhol, Robert Gober, and Virgil Marty used wallpaper to probe various aspects of identity and sexuality while celebrating decoration and transgressing the boundaries of fine art. In this reading, the author discusses Virgil Marty's wallpaper titled Bullies, in which Marty inserted the yearbook photos of tough boys he both feared and desired in junior high school. The black velvet surface and psychedelic effects he used relate back to interior designs from the 1970s. Marty's lowbrow aesthetic is intended to push back against the dominant tastes and attitudes of the heterosexual culture. This rendition also gives us an opportunity to talk about where this wallpaper exists and how the location can alter the meaning. Also discussed in this reading is an installation by Robert Gober. Gober creates a disturbing repeat pattern of two men, a sleeping white man and a lynched black man. Gober uses the association of wallpaper with domestic intimacy and its function as a decorative or background pattern to challenge the notion of the home as safe and comfortable. According to the author, 
Pairing it with the wedding dress prompts questions about how heterosexual fantasies, desires, and gender identifications are entwined with racial violence and sexual oppression. Another reading from the New York Times in 2022 is called The Wallpaper That Is Also a Reminder That My Ancestors Had My Back by Veronica Chambers. This article introduces us to interior designer Sheila Bridges, who developed a Harlem toile de Jouy pattern a familiar historic narrative upholstery fabric design that was first popularized in 17th century France. Sheila Bridges' toile features drawings of African Americans in ways that they're rarely featured, such as a couple in 18th century dress dancing under a structure that recalls the Arc de Triomphe to the tunes of a boombox in the grass, or an image of these women in ball gowns sitting under a tree one combing the other's hair, while another woman holds up a large mirror. Another image shows a courting couple feasting on a picnic. In addition to these readings, we also look at wallpapers created by a range of artists, such as this commemorative toile by Renee Green. In this piece, Green screen printed fabric to make a commentary on social class, race, and aestheticism. Using the toile pattern, Green made changes to the usual figurative vignettes, replacing some of the original vignettes with images she discovered in a book called The Image of the Black in Western Art, which was published in 1989. In this toile, Green presents the pastoral scenes from the original fabric placed side by side with scenes from antebellum America and colonial Europe. Other artists we look at for wallpaper inspiration include Takashi Murakami, Elizabeth Odiorn, Andrew Raftery, Melissa Haviland, and Andrew DeCon. I also like to show students some custom wallpapers by Flavor Paper, Spoonflower, and The Pattern Farm. To show students how to make a repeat pattern, I use this nifty Skillshare video by Julia Rothman. Start with a sheet of paper the size of your pattern unit. Draw your key image in the middle of the paper, extending outward, but don't draw to the edges. When done with the drawing, flip the paper over and then cut your drawing in half vertically using a knife and ruler. Flip the left and right sides, turn them over and tape across the back to hold them together. Be careful to line the two sides up exactly or your design will not align later. Then cut the paper in half horizontally. Again, flip the two halves, making sure that they're exactly aligned, and tape them across the back. So now draw in the open spaces in the center of your image to finish the design. When the key image is done, I recommend that you photocopy it at least four times to see how the units will align when placed side by side and above and below each other. From this key layer of the repeat pattern, you'll design all of your color layers. And now I'll quickly run through how to create a repeat pattern digitally. For this demo, I'm using an image that was created by one of my students for the assignment. This is the initial image that was created in the center of the page. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a thin red line bordering the image. The student added this as a way to ensure that his image would align throughout the design process. That line could also come in handy when trimming the prints down later. As you get started, I'd recommend that you turn on the grid and snap tools to help you with the alignment. I'll start by cutting the image in half vertically. I'll cut the right side of the image, paste it in place, and then move it to the left, snapping it in alignment with the left side of the image. And then I'll move the left side of the image to the right, snapping it into alignment. Double check that each half is exactly aligned. If it's off at this point, it's really going to mess up the alignment going forward. If it's good, I can merge those two layers. Then I'm going to cut the image in half horizontally. I'll cut the bottom half, paste it in place, and then move it to the top edge, snapping it in alignment. And finally, I'll move the top half down, snapping it along the bottom edge. Double check that both halves are aligned, and then merge those two layers. Okay, so this is the outer layer that will connect from unit to unit. Next, I'll add the inside layer that the student designed. In this case, there's space around the center image, but you could certainly connect your imagery to the outside image. Now this completes the entire key image, the black outline that will be used in the image. 
At this point I can add the color layers. You always want to create the key image first so you can align the colors to it without having to cut and flip each of the color layers. That would just be crazy. And there's a high probability of error in doing that. In this case, the student started with a CMYK image in the center. Normally, I don't encourage students to do CMYK with this project because it's complicated enough without it. Plus, I haven't shown students how to do CMYK at this point in the semester. However, this student had a digital background and understood how to do CMYK, so I let him run with it. In addition to the four process color layers, he also had to print a base layer of white beneath the CMYK because he was using cream colored paper. In addition to the CMYK layers, the student also added a gray layer, a gold layer, and a brown layer. At this point, you're ready to print out your image layers, expose them to screens, and print. When introducing students to the idea of designing a repeat pattern, I always start with the godfather, William Morris. The goal, at least for me, is to create a repeat pattern that is interlocking on all four sides, so that when the individual units are hung side by side, they flow into one another rather than stopping at the edges. This is an example of a student work that interlocks on all four sides. It still has a gridded feel, but you can see that components cross over the edges of one sheet of paper and on to the next. By contrast, this pattern only flows horizontally because the components touch on the left and right sides, but not the top and bottom. In this pattern, the components do go off the edges on the corners, but when assembled, you can see that the imagery floats in space. Therefore, I've learned that it's helpful to think about foreground and background layers of imagery so there aren't any significant open spaces in the design. In this case, the student did fill the space surrounding the circle, but when the units are assembled, the circle and the figure inside of it still dominate, and the grid in between somewhat disappears. So I've learned from this, and now recommend that students think about color and value shifts between the center area and the corners, so that there is a visual back and forth between those two areas. In this pattern, the artist has a richness of color and an interlocking design in the background pattern. However, the heads float in space because of the contrast between the heads and the background. In my opinion, it would be a more dynamic design if the little corner diamonds were enlarged and expanded to take up some of the background patterning in order to get more of a visual back and forth between those two areas. So really, I'm trying to get students to think about how their repeat pattern will move us visually in horizontal and vertical directions, and hopefully also diagonally. I'm not going to show you how to print in this video because I assume you already know how to do that. So let's just move on from there. When you've finished printing, it's time to trim the borders off the prints so we can hang them on the wall. Start by laying one of the prints on a self-healing mat and take a sturdy ruler and carefully lay it on top of your image. So just the very outer edge of your print shows. I always cut from the inside out, so I'm cutting away from my image and protecting my image so I don't accidentally slip with the knife. Line up the ruler along the edge so you can just see the color sticking out. You want to make sure you're not cutting off any of the color, otherwise your image won't align exactly. But you also don't want to leave any of the white border because you'll end up with a white line between your repeat patterns. So you're going to cut all four sides like that and then cut down the rest of your addition so that you're ready to hang the prints. At this point, all of the prints have been trimmed, so we're ready to hang them on the wall. I'll start by flipping one over, and I'm going to cut or tear five to six inch strips of masking tape to put on the back. Take one strip, roll it up, and put it as close as you can to the corner edges of the paper. There's a tendency for the paper to want to curl while it's on the wall, so you really want to pull against that by having the tape close to the edges. If you tape too far in, it won't stop it from curling. You also want to put a piece of tape along the center edge on all four sides to reinforce it. In the end, you're going to tape all the way around for each print that you're going to hang on the wall, so it's going to be a lot of taping. Basically, each student is going to go through about three quarters of a roll of tape. So make sure you have plenty of tape available. By the way, I'm using scotch masking tape for this. 
but make sure you get the contractor grade because it holds up much better. I mistakenly bought cheaper masking tape once and the print started falling off the wall after a day or two. I find that the contractor grade holds up really well and it doesn't leave significant damage on the back of the print when you take the prints off the wall. Okay, with that done, we're ready to start hanging the wallpaper units. This is my favorite part, when the magic happens. Our hallway display panels are about 8 feet tall by 4 feet wide, so that's where we hang our prints. And you'll see that each student gets one panel in which to hang their wallpaper. In order to get students to hang their wallpapers somewhat evenly compared to the other students' wallpapers, I ask students to measure up from the floor 62 inches and use that as their starting point. They can use drafting tape, string, or a ruler to mark it on the wall, rather than marking with pencil. I find that a ruler works best, held up by thumbtacks. That way the line is really straight. But use a level to make sure it's even from left to right. And mark the center point with a tack. Once I've established that line, I can begin hanging the wallpaper, starting at the center and working my way out. It's important that the first line of wallpaper is absolutely centered and straight on the wall. If it's not level now, the whole thing is going to veer off in one direction the further you go up or down. Eventually I will have seven rows going from top to bottom but this is my center row, so I will be putting three rows above and three rows below this. So a couple of tips I can offer while I'm hanging. Usually if things go wrong with the hanging of the wallpaper, it's because students didn't cut the print squarely when they trimmed them down. So the prints don't line up correctly on the wall, in which case you'll see a bit of white of the wall showing through. Also, for students who plan to print a lot of solid colors in the repeat pattern, especially large blocks of color, I'd recommend that they print one or two flats on the back of the paper to counteract the warping effect, because if the print is already warping before it's hung on the wall, the curling's only going to get worse. While I'm working, I should mention that we tend to leave these wallpapers on display for three to four weeks, so the prints will start curling along the edges no matter what. Therefore, we occasionally need to pat the prints down to ensure that the tape is still sticking. You can see that the assembly of the wallpaper goes faster once you get into a rhythm. And now that I'm done, I can step back and enjoy the full effect. Thanks for watching my video.